it, it was a thought that I had held this in for so long that I felt like I couldn't talk to them about this for so long. And they were, you know, I found this out later. They were just like, it, it, the weight of the fact that I had to keep this secret from them for so long and how that must have made me feel, which they were right. It wasn't easy. Um, that's what hurt them the most. Um, and so like at that moment, I mean, everybody really just wanted me to know that I was supported, that they didn't care and that it literally changed nothing. And despite the tears, it was more just, we want you to know that we love you. What's up everybody and welcome to the Queerly Black Show. I'm your host, Ashley, and I'm so happy you came by. The Queerly Black Show aims to normalize the everyday existence of Black, LGBTQIA plus individuals through an interview-style series with regular folks like you and me. So every week, a new guest shares their story and unique perspective on their existence as an LGBTQIA plus individual. Thank you for tuning in, and make sure you subscribe, download, set your reminders to the podcast so you never miss an episode. Enjoy the show. Welcome back to another episode of the Queerly Black Show. I'm your host, Ashley. I'm joined today, man. This man really needs no introduction, but we're going to introduce him anyway. We got Greg Mathis Jr. in the building, y'all. Greg, tell the people about yourself. What's up, Ashley? My name is uh, Greg Mathis Jr. You might know me from Mathis Family Matters on E, but um, I'm a political advocate, worked in politics for a long time, now doing a lot of good work in entertainment, um, and excited to be here today. Awesome, man. We're, we're excited to have you. I'm super, super excited. Uh, you know, I'm a fan of the show. We're going to talk about the show a little bit. We won't give everything away because people do need to go watch. But listen, this family is hilarious. First of all, your dad is absolutely hilarious. Like, uh, it just, I, like, first episode, he's locking y'all outside. Like, it's just, it's just a whole lot, a whole lot of going on. But um, before we get into that, we're going to talk about you. Mm -hmm. So let's go back to the beginning. Um, when did you know that you were gay? So I knew I was gay since I was five, which I know a lot of people are surprised when I say that. And I'm surprised to hear that a lot of people didn't know sooner. It's interesting to me that there is that spectrum. I knew from a young age and I never told anybody. Um, <clears throat> I, I didn't tell my family until I was a freshman in college. They really found out, to be honest. I still wasn't comfortable enough to tell them. They found out, and thank God they loved and supported me. But then, you know, and as this shows on Mathis Family Matters, I really didn't get comfortable enough myself to come out until I was in my 30s. Yeah. How'd they, how'd they find out when you were in college? Um, <laughs> so I was uh, dating a guy low-key, or I thought I was being low-key. And someone at school found out and told my brother. So my brother calls me. I get this phone call out of the blue. I'm not expecting it at all. He goes, hey, Greg, I got a call from somebody at Michigan. And they said that, you know, you're up there dating a man and that you're gay. And I just, you know, my instinct is my body went red. I was, you know, the heat on the back of your neck starts standing up and your stomach starts crunching. And I'm like, what do I say? So my instinct is just to lie, like, I, like I'd always done. So I'm like, no, it's not true. And I hang up the phone, you know, we wrap it up. I'm like, that's not true. They're lying. I hang up the phone. And then I think about it. And I'm like, at this point, like, I might as well call them back and tell them the truth because the cat is out of the bag. Whoever told them knows, you know, it's clearly true. So I call them back and I, um, and I go, okay, it's true. You know, I am, this is what's going on. And he was like, okay, I don't care. You know, I love you, blah, blah, blah. And that made me feel great. And then I say, but please don't tell anybody else. Don't tell the rest of the family because I don't want, um, you know, I'm just not ready to tell them yet. I'll tell them soon. And I hung up the phone. And literally two minutes after that phone call, and I always laugh because I say my brother outed me and I know it's not good to out people. But two minutes after that call, my dad calls me crying. And he's like, I love you, son. Like, you know, you don't ever have to hide something like this. I fully support you. And that feel great in that moment. I really appreciated it. Um, but still mad at your brother. Still, I was mad, but I look back on it and I really do feel grateful for it because I don't think if that moment had happened that I would have, it would have been years before I told my family. I don't think I would have, um, it, it made it easier for me. It was almost like, I mean, coming out for me was hard. I imagine it's difficult for most people. It's just that working up the nerve to have those conversations. I'm already a nervous person. And so just having a serious, intense conversation like that is hard for me. And um, I would have put it off. I would have kept putting it off. And so it was almost like a relief when he did it. 
even though it's not good out people, I was like, thank God, you know, it's done. My family's here. I got their support and it made me feel good. But even with that being the case, it took me years to come out to everybody else. Yeah. So when you were growing up, so you said like you, you're shocked that more people didn't know. Right. Like, what do you feel like were the things that you were either doing or like um, giving off that like people should have like clued into? Like, what were those things? Well, and I don't even mean like not know about me, like in terms of not knowing I was gay. I meant, you know, I've told people in the past, like I knew when I was five years old that I was attracted to men and not women. You know, at least that's what I, that's what I remember. You know, when you start being attracted, I was never really attracted to girls. And I know a lot of um, stories I've heard from LGBTQ folks will be that they didn't discover it until much later in life. And so it's always fascinated me that there is that wide spectrum of people that never kind of had those sentiments when they were younger. Because for me, it was like I knew and I just knew I had to hide it because I was told it was bad. I was going to church every Sunday and hearing that, you know, I was going to go to hell and that I was going to, um, you know, and that there was something wrong with me. And so it wasn't that I didn't know I was gay. I knew I was gay. I just knew that it was wrong. And I would try and pray to not be gay. I would go home and um, uh, I, I don't say this one a lot because it's a little graphic, but I would go home and watch girl on girl porn once I got to a certain age to try and make myself not be gay. And um, I say that to say, yeah, so, so it's always interesting to me when I hear stories about folks that like they didn't discover they were gay until, um, you know, 18, 19, or even some people as late as 30, 40, 50, because it really shows that spectrum of, uh, you know, how the human body can work and how people can discover themselves in different ways. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, no, because I'm with you. I knew from the first time I saw a cute girl, I was like, okay, yeah, it's not <laughs> <laughs> it's not giving what I think he's supposed to give y'all. <laughs> but it also, I mean, it also shows like, I don't know about for you, like I am squarely gay. Um, you know, I have friends who are bisexual or maybe gay, but there's still some level of interest in women. Like I have never been attracted to or aroused, but like I tell, I can tell a woman is beautiful. I can tell mm -hmm. a woman that I understand when someone is attractive, but there's never been that sexual attraction for me. Never, never. <laughs> No, never. Both my wife and I are both just, no, just <laughs> <it's> never. <laughs> it was never that. Um, but I also, I mean, I think the one of the interesting things about uh, your story, your dad is super supportive. Your whole family is super, super supportive. And I think one thing people don't really understand is like how you can be so like afraid to like come out, right? Like there are a lot of people who are like, oh, their parents are super supportive. Mine's very similar to yours. My mom was like, okay, like, okay what's for dinner like it was very like okay on to the next kind of thing but talk about for you your experience of like telling your parents and being afraid but they're so they're so accepting like the like the the disconnect for people of like well but your family is so like accepting why would you be afraid you obviously talk about going to church and then just the community you grew up in Detroit so talk mm -hmm. about just kind of all the other circumstances that would make that uncomfortable for you I mean, yeah, that, I mean, you hit it on the head. Like that was the hard part. It's not my family, but my community, my church, my friends. It was the situation where even though I knew I had that support at home from my family, you know, it's not like I can just interact with my family for the rest of my life. And those are the only people who are important in my life that I have to deal with. I think it would be, you know, it'd be a different story if my family were the only people in the world I ever had to interact with or ever had to deal with. Um, for me, it was, it was, unfortunately, and, you know, look, I'm a Christian, I go to church, I, you know, I, it was a, you know, practice faithfully, but um, I wasn't always in a church that was accepting that, you know, I was in a church that had the wrong interpretation of what the Bible says when it comes to homosexuality, and they preached that I was going to hell, they preached that there was something wrong with me, and that did damage to me, I'm not even, gonna, I'm not going to sugarcoat it and say it didn't. You know, that was a traumatic experience I had during my childhood, both at church and even when you go to school. I mean, we hear about bullying. I was never bullied because, I, you know, no one knew I was gay. But, I, you know, we were on the playground and you hear people be called gay and people that maybe acted a certain way were targeted. And so it was always, oh, I don't want to act that way because then people know I was gay. You know, you hide your mannerisms and the way you speak because you don't want to be a target of that um of that type of behavior, both, you know, home, church, bully, or home, church, school, 
Um, thank God for me, it was never home, like you said, because I had an accepted family. But it's still, when you go outside the home, it was that fear of how I would be judged by the community and also how my family would be judged by the community. And you know? so it took me a long time to get to that point of comfortability where I was like, I don't care what these people say. And it feels a lot better now that I'm here, which is why I'm happy that we have this opportunity to do the show because I'm hoping it does show other people that once you get to that point of being able to be authentic with yourself, it really, um, you know, it just allows you to live a whole different type of life where you don't have to worry about stuff because people are always going to judge. They're always going to critique. They're always going to have something to say about the way you live your life. It could be your sexuality. I mean, now that we have this show and we're a bit in the public eye, it could be something you said as a joke that someone took the wrong way. It can be anything. People are always going to um, criticize and just have opinions and that's their right to have. And the one thing I've learned is that we got to be authentic in who we are as people and confident in our own skin. Absolutely. And you, uh, <laughs> you're in politics, which <laughs> is also uh, not a place where, you know, there's, there's like a, a carve out for, <laughs> you know, being comfortable as a, a queer person. Um, but in that, so you went to school where, where'd you go to college? Uh, University of Michigan. University of Michigan. Okay. And then when did you guys move to DC? Uh, I moved to DC in 2012. Um, Elliot moved there, I believe we didn't meet until 2006, 15. And so Elliot, um, I, he moved to DC before me, I believe, but we didn't know each other when we first moved to DC. We moved there separately. Okay. He moved there, um, to work, uh, as an engineer and I moved to work in politics. And then several years later we met, um, and then uh, we've been together for about six years now. Nice. And I did. Yeah, you, you kind of went right into it. Uh, how did you and Elliot meet? So we met on Valentine's Day. We had a um, so romantic. Mutual, I know. <laughs> we had a mutual best friend that um, all of us were single at the time. And we had a mutual best friend that was like, let's all get together and go out since we don't have anybody else to go out with on Valentine's Day. So it started off with a big group of us. And then we all like bar hopped up and down the street. We ended up going back the entire group to my place and, um, you know, having drinks there after we went out. And Elliot and I really just hit it off. And we have been together literally since then. I mean, just. Well, which, close to. I always laugh because six years is like a million years in gay. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> who who approached to? I mean, I like to say he did. He likes to say I did. Because I'll give you the details. This is, I think this might be the first time I gave this many details about how it actually Yes. <laughs> but, um, you know, we went back to my place, I told you, and everybody trickled out and kind of left. And it got to the point where everybody else had left. And Elliot and I were the only people there just sitting there talking. And he was sitting across the room and I was sitting on my couch. And he likes to say that I approached him first because I said, why are you sitting all the way over there? You should come sit on the couch next to me. Oh, that's a player line. <laughs> that's a player line. <laughs> but Oh, I Greg, like it was you, man. <laughs> <laughs> but I like to say that he approached me because why didn't he leave with everybody else? It was well, morning at that point and everybody else is trickling out the house he was still sobering up <laughs> he didn't take the was? drive yet and you I bet you were sitting there too you was like you were sitting there across the couch <laughs> your legs was probably you know a little open just looking at him so I just wanted to make I sure got, I don't have no cup in my hand but you probably had your cup still you was like why are you sitting all the way over there I can see it <laughs> And one of fancy DC apartments. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, man. Yep. Player, player. All right, Greg. Um, yeah, he, he came to sit on the couch. And then um, we, uh, yeah. That's what's up, man. That's what's that up. Fellowship. <laughs> that felt, there you go. <laughs> well, it's funny because um, my, my wife and I, when, uh, when we, when, we met, it was a, it was similar, but different because we took a little longer, which is odd because lesbians usually are, you know, moving fast, but. Um, I always hate telling that story because I'm like, <laughs> that sounds so fast, but. Huh? It no, 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 it, it's cool, but <laughs> I, I, I understand the connection. Uh, we we were uh, freshmen in college and um, she, 
we had, there was like a group of 10 of us, like freshman week, we hung out every single day and we were at the step show at Howard and sitting in um, um, Crampton Auditorium and all the, all the rest of them were going to a party after the step show and neither one of us were going and it happened. There's like 10 of us. The two of us were the only two that didn't go. And that was like when we like connected and like started hanging out after that, like that, that day. And actually it was funny because she was like, oh, yeah, are you going to um, are you going to chapel tomorrow? And I was like, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, and so then we kind of bonded over like going to church and like all this other stuff, which was kind of crazy because, you know, church and gay, and, like, you know, you know, the whole thing. So it was just interesting. But like that, it was it was kind of similar just in terms of being with a whole group of people. And then like it yeah. ended up just being the two of us. You said that was freshman year? Yeah, we've been together for 14 years. Jeez, congratulations. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, no, it's great. It's, 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 it's awesome. I mean, six years. 14 years, that's a long time to be yeah. together in, in, uh, in this community, especially. Um, so, no, that's a awesome. A lot of people ask me during these interviews, how did Elliot and I, you know, how we've been together for six years? I need to be asking you questions. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we just, you know, we just let each other be ourselves. I think that's probably the biggest thing is like, we just, I don't control her. She doesn't control me. We let each other be our authentic selves and we respect each other and, as life has changed, because we were together so young, we've mm -hmm. learned to just let that progression happen for each other, you know, going from 18 years old to now over 30, you know, undergrad, law school, I went to grad school, we've been long distance for two years, um, you know, we don't have, you know, she has a, a her family's very religious, uh, Pentecostal Christian, so that was a challenge, just going through all of the motions, but we always stayed together, like, we always just were like, we're on the same team, regardless of what we're facing. It's you and me, you know, we'll, we'll get through it. Like let's separate the problem from our relationship and let's look at the problem by itself and attack that. And then like, but at the end of the day, I'm never against you. Like that's never my intention, but you have to trust your person to have yep. that disposition, you know, cause some of that no, stuff is not comfortable. That point, but I, I completely agree because I heard, um, I can't remember which one it was, but Will and Jada, one of them said this about their relationship. I think it may have been Will, but he said, you know, it's not my, I don't go into this relationship looking or looking to make her whole or looking to make her a certain type of person and vice versa. You know, I, I don't expect that from her. What I'm here to do, you know, I bring my best self to the table and who yeah. I am to the table. And I'm looking at her to enhance my happiness, not to make my happiness, you know, yeah. it's like we have to be who we are and we have to be our, you know, we have to do the work to get to that point to where we're healthy enough to be in a relationship. And then what, what, what you do in a relationship from the way I see it is you enhance that happiness of, of the other person by yeah. being there and supporting them and being yeah. able to enjoy things together. But Absolutely. I think a lot of times people run into that problem of, thinking that a relationship is going to make them whole in some way that they may not already be, which is like, that's the work you got to do to be ready. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, you definitely got to be whole and it, it's got to be complimentary. I think one of the biggest things like with us is <laughs> she's not a, um, I'm a very like extroverted, like I'll speak to anybody. I'll talk to a dog on the street. That's my personality. And mm -hmm. she's like, oh yeah, no, nah, I don't know that. I don't know where that dog been at. <laughs> you know, like she's kind of like, you know, I always say I'm like a credit card. I give people the credit up front. She's like a debit card. If you ain't put nothing in, you ain't getting nothing out. And I like so I think yeah. I'm to you and Elliot's closer to your wife. Yeah. And so, you know, we'll go, you know, we'll go out or we'll be around people. And one of the biggest things that I have grown to love so much about her is that about her personality, because me, you know, she'll be like, yeah, babe, don't like that that person mm, no that situation no and it used to frustrate me but then like as we've gotten older met more people been in more situations I've grown to like appreciate that about her and vice versa like where I'll be like no baby it's cool you can you know open up a little bit and vice versa she'll be like yeah no nah, don't 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 give so much of yourself in this situation but yeah. even understanding and accepting that like that those those things where like it might be kind of converse to your personality but like I recognize the strength of having a person who balances me in that way you know so even those types of things um recognizing each other's strengths and living into that to make your relationship better or this podcast I'm the face like I'm the one that talks to everybody but like we, we sit down together she's like the executive producer she gives me like all the notes she's like hey ask them this talk about this talk about that and that works because her mind you know, she's a lawyer so everything is like <laughs> 
<laughs> let's do it this way. And I'm kind of like, okay, yeah, let's just talk about all this fun stuff. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's a balance, um, but we love it. It's, it's, it's great. Yeah, for sure. I get you an earpiece one day so she can say, don't forget to talk right, about right, right. <laughs> Oh, you do have an earpiece. Yeah, I got, I got my headphones, but yeah, she might. Yeah, I have to add that. We'll see if it's in the budget. <laughs> um, so talk a little bit about your, um, your political career and uh, how, 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 how's, how have you been successful in that? Obviously, your dad's a judge, but you know, how, how have you, how'd you get into politics? And then how, how you've been successful outside of your dad's kind of shadow? Yeah. No, I mean, yeah, the first thing that the reason I got into politics in the first place, like even with my dad having a political background, it wasn't solely because of that. I mean, maybe I had more exposure to stuff because that's what he was always interested in and talking about. But I remember just um, for me, it was always that the, the recognition that like policy and how it impacts people. I mean, it really is how the world turns, in my opinion. I mean, you can't you know, I, like you talked about, I love people. I love talking to people, learning about people. And so it was seeing the disparate impact that policy decisions have on people. I mean, we were on, my dad and I were on the Today Show earlier this week. And one of the things we talked about was how he grew up in public housing without a father and how there weren't a lot of fathers in the households when he grew up in public housing. And one of the reasons that was the case is because in public housing during that time, there was a policy decision that said, you can't have an able-bodied man in the household and qualify for public housing because they won't, you know, it was the idea that you need to get out there and work. Mm -hmm. And so, and here, you know, the flip side of that policy decision is that you're splitting up households. You're splitting up households and to the extent that a lot of those homes did not have fathers in the household or any men in the household and role models for a lot of the young folks to look up to. And so it was policy decisions like that that really got me interested in politics and wanting to go to DC and make a difference. Um, so I started out um, working for Jesse Jackson Jr. as an intern. And I mean, I, I really, you know, I, that was a job I loved. I mean, Jesse Jackson Jr., um, he was one of the first people talking about health care for everybody. Um, that's, you know, that's something I was able to work on much later in my career in Washington, D.C. Um, after I worked for Jesse Jackson Jr., I worked for a uh, uh, congressman from Michigan, but also worked on President Obama's reelection campaign in Ohio. That was one of the highlights. And most recently, I worked for Mark Warner in the U.S. Senate. And it was really that opportunity. Like, we passed legislation that expanded health care to millions of Americans. And I mean, that's stuff that people a lot of times I think goes under their radar. But when you look at it, I mean, health care is the number one cause of bankruptcy in this country, even still today. When you look at the socioeconomic impact and how there's so much health care disparity, I mean, if you look at African Americans, we have a higher instance of diabetes, we have a higher instance of height of heart disease things that can be preventable with the proper medical care. And a lot of that is because we're twice as likely to not have insurance as our white counterparts. And so it was really for me wanting to work on those issues and that was the best part of it. Right now, I'm no longer actively working in government. I actually transitioned a bit to, um, I'm working on some really cool entertainment projects with my dad. In addition to the reality show that we have, we're gonna be producing some content. Um, he has a production company, my brother has a production company we're working on. And what I'm hoping to do there is the same way I was in politics to make a difference. I think uh, I'm in a special opportunity to really tell some stories that don't get told enough, stories that reflect our community, both you know, being Black Americans, but also um, uh, LGBTQ Americans, and really putting pushing more of those stories to the forefront in a way they haven't been told in the past. Because um, what I've recognized is since transitioning from more of a political role to entertainment is that representation is important. And I started doing a lot of um, mental health work with uh, an organization I'm working with now. And the data shows it's clear when people are validated, when people feel like there's support, they're less likely to suffer from what a lot of people in the LGBTQ community do, which is death by suicide yeah. or have a suicide attempt or have a mental health condition because they feel reflected, because they feel represented. And so that's kind of what I'm really looking forward to in my next chapter. Yeah, no, that's that's incredible, man. That's that's awesome. Well, let me know if you need any extras. So I'll stand in the back, whatever. You know, no big deal. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so let's talk about the show, man. Matters Family Matters. Um, 
specifically your dynamic, your your siblings. So there's four of you guys, right? Mm-hmm. Where are you at in the pecking order of your siblings? Well, I am the third oldest. I have two older sisters, one younger brother. So kind of stuck in the middle somewhere. And your little brother is the one that ratted you off. Yep. He is. <laughs> He's also the one that signs us all up for this reality TV show. Yeah, <laughs> I was gonna ask you. So, 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 with your sisters, just to round out the um, you you coming out, how how the conversation go with your sisters once uh, you were out? I mean, it really was the fairy tale of like everybody was supportive. I mean, at the time, my mom was actually in London with one of my sisters. And right after I got off the phone with my dad, they both called me crying, and they feel so bad because they weren't able to be closer to me they were all you know, in a whole another country while they were you know from their perspective they were just crying they were crying because they it, it was a thought that I had held this in for so long that I felt like I couldn't talk to them about this for so long and they were you know I found this out later they were just like it it the weight of the fact that I had to keep this secret from them for so long and how that must have made me feel which they were right it wasn't easy um that's what hurt them the most um, and so like at that moment, I mean, everybody really just wanted me to know that I was supported, that they didn't care and that it literally changed nothing. And despite the tears, it was more just, we want you to know that we love you and we don't ever want you to question that. Yeah. And I mean, they will literally go after anybody. It's funny because after I came out or after I, you know, after they found out I was gay, my younger brother, he, he went to Chicago. He went to Columbia college in Chicago he joined the gay baseball team. Gay <laughs> team. He had, because I still wasn't quite like out, you know, it, it, even when I went to school, I was just operating under the radar, trying to play it cool. And when I would go visit him in Chicago, he would have me at these gay happy hours with all his gay friends. He had more gay friends than me. <laughs> <laughs> that was his allyship. <laughs> yep. I love it. I love I it. <laughs> He's probably running around like my brother. My brother's gay. He's gay. My brother's gay. <laughs> <laughs> I can be here. My brother's gay. <laughs> that's, kind of, so, that's hilarious. I realize how blessed I am to have that because yeah. everybody doesn't. And I mean, we, you talked about the show a little bit. That's one of the, when Amir, the executive producer of the show, my brother was trying to convince us to do the show. He was like, you know, that was one of the things I thought about because I wasn't sure how I was going to approach this, if I was going to be open, if I was going to play it under the radar still and just let people think what they wanted to think, Elliot's my friend or whatever. Um, and, you know, we, we made a decision that it was important for us to have an impact because we do have a loving family. We do have something that isn't shown a lot. We do have a healthy monogamous relationship. And so I think that when you look at that in the LGBTQ community, that's important for people to see because they don't see it a lot. And I think even just hopefully family seeing how my parents and my family have embraced Elliot and I will help other parents realize that they can do the same thing. You know, you don't have to, um, you know, that you don't have to um, throw your kids. You don't have to be discriminatory. You don't have to be bigoted towards them. And um, yeah. I've already heard from people, which, you know, it's, it is it is rewarding to hear. That's my favorite part about doing this project is that um, I am hearing, you know, even in-person stories through social media, people who are reaching out and saying like their parents call them or they call their parents, vice versa. And it's really starting a healthy conversation. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, probably the biggest thing that I love, and it's something I love so much about Dwayne Wade too, is that a Black man is standing in that gap because I think that's probably been the missing piece of this puzzle because mom is always like in the back like hiding out like I support you baby and you know like mom you kind of always get that from mom right but if dad's voice is bigger she's gonna hide even her acceptance from him you know and kind of play like well, that's my baby. That's my, that's my kid. I love him. But never like when the, when the man stands up just because from a hierarchical standpoint in the traditional family, when the black man stands up and says, this is my son and I accept him magic Johnson as well. Right. This is my son and I accept him. That changes the game, you know, especially you're talking about, you know, in, in, in queer language, cisgendered straight men that are like a man's man. I was about you to know, say, like I mean, your dad is a man's man, yeah. you know, uh, 
Dwayne Wade, a man's man. Magic Johnson's a, you know, the a world renowned basketball player. These are like men, right? And not that men in, in any specific way, but just the, 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 this head of household figure, like standing up and saying, these are my kids. I love them. That is like completely game changing, you know, for, yeah. for our community, because that's been the missing piece for, for, for so long. And so I just appreciate your dad so much for, for, for that. And just, you know, I did watch, um, where, you know, you guys were talking and he was saying, um, you know, have you ever had to, you know, lie about your sexuality and how kind of like you could see him just crumbling in his seat. Cause he was just so sad that you felt like that was something you had to do. Um, what kind of conversations like have you had, you know, with your dad about just like not feeling bad about, you know, any of it? Because he definitely internalizes a lot. It obviously shows on the show just as you guys talk about the story. But what kind of conversations do you have with him? I mean, yeah, he still gets emotional when I talk about it today. And even in that scene, I was shocked at how emotional it made him. Um, you know, like you said, my dad is from the streets. I usually, you know, he's a tough guy. Like he doesn't cry a lot. But in that moment, it really, he really broke down when I told him that even after coming out to my family all these years ago, that I wasn't out to most of the people in DC. I think when I would go home and when he would see, you know, my close friends and people that I would bring around that maybe knew things, you know, he just envisioned in his head that it was like, okay, cool. He's got his friend circle. Like he's got his close friends. He's good. But not thinking that outside of, you know, my closest maybe network of 10, 15 friends, that there's a whole world out there that I just don't, I, I haven't been honest with. And, you know, at, at work when people would ask me about who am I dating or my girlfriend, I would make up stories. I would just lie. I would say nobody. Um, I would, you know, and just do the things that I'm sure a lot of us have done to keep their personal life separate from work or separate from their associates. It's just kind of like a whole smoke and mirrors routine of, um, you know, and I think uh, with him after hearing that, like he was hurt because he, it's the same thing my mom said when I first came out in college. She was like, I can only imagine how hard it is for you to have to be two completely different people. You know, yeah. you're one way that, at this time, you're another completely different person at this time. I mean, you're carrying the weight and trying to juggle all of these two different people and multiple personalities. That's just not healthy for anybody to do. And so I think that's what hurt him the most. And then in a certain sense, which I recognize even more now after having come out and being my authentic self is you're shrinking yourself. You know, you don't want to, it's almost like you don't want to be the full version of yourself because you don't want to attract attention from people that then want to know more about you, want to ask more questions about you. You almost have to shrink away so that there's not a lot of interest in you and people don't want to know more about you. And so I think, you know, those are the conversations we've had. And I mean, he challenged me in that moment to really think about the flip side of things and not think about, how me being public about being gay is going to impact our family or his career or, or me, because that's a selfish way to think about it. But like how being open and authentic could help other people yeah. and how, you know, we could really, and how I could be an advocate for my community. Don't, don't sit back and be afraid to be who you are, but really, you know, step out into the light and challenge people who are bigoted and speak out against people who are bigoted so that I can help other people. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, man. So what can we expect from the next um, next couple episodes of, uh, of the show? Well, Sunday, <clears throat> when is this episode air? It's, next it's, week. Uh, next week? Okay. <clears throat> Sorry. So the season finale is this Sunday. Um, this episode will air probably a week after that season finale then. So I would say um, it's going to be a good episode. It's going to be a good episode. We got some surprises in store for y'all. If you've seen the trailer, you might uh, see Elliot getting down on one knee. So I'm excited for y'all to see the end product of that. And um, what else? My dad is getting his star on the Walk of Fame. And uh, it's just all good things as we wrap up this season and then getting ready to kick off season two, hopefully sometime next year. Yeah, that's awesome, man. And you guys will be uh, in L.A. still or are you going back to D.C.? I know you told your dad it was a trial run. In the, in the, <laughs> he's, he's looking forward to y'all staying. So did y'all decide? <laughs> we did. We did. Um, and you'll find that out in the season finale, too. Okay, good, good, good. Yeah, I did that. Y'all got to watch to find out. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Awesome, man. Well, thank you so much for, for coming on the show. Um, One final question for you is, if you had advice for someone going through their own queer journey, struggling with similar things as you, what advice would you give them? Yeah, Um, 
I mean, look, everybody has their own journey and own comfort level, but the personal advice that I can give is as hard as it was for me to come out and as long as it took for me to get to that point, I feel like I'm the best version of myself right now than I ever have been in life because I'm able to live authentically. And I'm finally at that point where my skin is thick enough to not really care about what people think. Because people, like I said, are always going to judge, always going to critique. And when you're able to get that to that point of being authentic and tuning out people who are not going to be healthy to you, um, that's when you're going to be the happiest. Absolutely, man. Totally, totally. All right. Well, y'all listen, man. This is Greg Mathis Jr. right here, man. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Really Mm -hmm. appreciate you sharing your story everything that you're doing. Uh, Congratulations to you and Elliot on your future, on coming out, on being open, sharing your story. Um, Y'all listen, this is another episode of the Queerly Black Show. I'm your host, Ashley. I'm gonna catch y'all on the next one. Thank you.